Hello, jean -Dur. Hello, Kevin. In the last video, we were talking about the representation of movements and mechanics and how this relates to coordination and uh, how it relates to having a, a mental model of the torso. So can you talk a bit more about that, please? Yes, um, it's my idea to continue with this, but um, I've recently heard a, uh, a story told by a modern Alexander Technique teacher about the use of the self. And uh, I thought that it, it was a good thing to, um, to analyze how stories are motivating people. And so uh, it's quite well known that um, when Alexander was young and in his first books, he was talking a lot about the position of mechanical advantage. And um, later on, the stories of the modern somatic teacher is that uh, Alexander stopped using it and uh, went on to a very more spiritualized form of the Alexander technique, there, where um, any position can be good use, uh, where in fact you, you don't need to, to direct the movements of the parts. You don't need a plan really. You don't need to measure angles. You don't, it, it, makes, it makes no sense. This is the, maybe the old Del Sartian way, but uh, Alexander moved on and went on into a very uh, a direct form of teaching with his hands, communicating directly with people. So a completely abandoned med mechanical advantage. So this had me thinking, and um, it, it's interesting to, to analyze the story. It, that is, what is the story the teacher is, is saying, and uh, why is he saying it? Of course, he, he, he wants to, in fact, uh, develop the idea that use has nothing to do with uh, the movements of the different parts and uh, with their organization with the planning, with something that would be uh, thought in advance and that would in fact uh, determine uh, what is correct, what is right, what is going in the right direction and what is not. Uh, in this way, the teacher can be seen in all sorts of positions that I would consider a position of mechanical advantage and still say, no, 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 uh, this is good use in fact, because good use is much more than the, the, the use of the parts. Alexander defines uh, the use of the self very often as the use of the parts. So I thought, wow, this is interesting. Uh, this contrast be between the old times where position of mechanical advantage were the center. Uh, you had to bring your pupil to experience. And uh, Alex, I, I prefer when he says to study the position of mechanical advantage. So uh, there was this idea that uh, uh, Alexander had all his life that uh, if he could, um, in fact, help the pupil to have an ocular demonstration of his own uh, movements that would combine together into what he called the position of mechanical advantage, the person would be able to study the position of mechanical advantage. And it's true that uh, in the, uh, the, the two books, the two last books, uh, you cannot find uh, the term position of mechanical advantage. So, uh, well, it is uh, more or less accepted, and that was the story of the somatic teacher, is that uh, Alexander, well, got rid of position of mechanical advantage. So, uh, to start with, we are going to, to look at um, what Alexander uh, is saying about the position of mechanical advantage on a very small extract, because I, I wanted to point to um, a demonstration or more or less description of what is a position of, a, of mechanical Alexander, uh, of a mechanical advantage for Alexander. And so uh, this is quite interesting to, to start with this. So this is the image of a page. Of course, it's the first book. It's Man's Supreme Inheritance. And it's, uh, well, on the fourth, on, on the third edition, sorry, it's uh, page 114. A simple practical example of what is meant 
by obtaining the position of mechanical advantage may be given. I will stop straight away on the first sentence because um, th there is a, a concept that we call the position of mechanical advantage. But I want to stress to start with that uh, what the pupil uh, must learn is not the position of mechanical advantage as such. So that, that, that is, uh, uh, Alexander could uh, bring the pupil to be in a certain position and the, the pupil will experience that position, maybe associate that position with certain sentences to describe uh, how the organization is functioning. But here, I really mean that uh, what really Alexander really mean is that uh, it's obtaining the position of mechanical advantage. And uh, by obtaining the position of mechanical advantage, the idea is, uh, of course, uh, to have a certain idea of the series of movements or series of preliminary acts that are necessary for, um, in fact, executing the position of mechanical advantage. At, at first, uh, you can place a pupil in a position uh, but the, 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 that, that does not at all imply that uh, the pupil himself or herself will be able to, in fact, reproduce the means whereby obtaining the position of mechanical advantage. So, now that this is clear, clarified, let's go and see what Alexander has to say. Let the subject sit as far back in a chair as possible, so that the pupil is sitting, and the teacher having decided upon the orders necessary for the elongation of the spine, the freedom of the neck, uh, requisite natural laxness, and other conditions there is desirable for the particular case in hand, will then ask the pupil to rehearse these or those orders mentally, at the same time that he himself renders assistance by the skillful use of his hands. Then, holding with one hand one or two books against the inner back of the chair, he will rely upon the pupil mentally rehearsing the orders necessary to maintain and improve the conditions present, while he, the teacher, with the other hand placed upon the pupil's shoulder, causes the body gradually to incline backwards until its weight is taken by the back of the chair. The position thus secured is one of a number which I employ and which for want of a better name I refer to as a position of mechanical advantage. Uh, by the way, uh, this is the only one that Alexander has ever uh, described or described what he was uh, doing for the pupil to assume the position of mechanical advantage. A and so uh, this demonstration is very interesting. And uh, I'm going to come back to it time and again during this uh, demonstration. So that's it. We, ha we have now an idea of what is a position of mechanical advantage. Yes, uh, but there is something that we can start with. Uh, it, it's that it's rather strange that uh, the position of mechanical advantage is not to be inclined backward upon a chair, really. Because, uh, of course, the conditions that are necessary to, in fact, maintain what we call the elongation of the spine during the movement, from s just sitting to going back and leaning, well, uh, I will try and demonstrate that uh, if the pupil uh, is not already understanding what are the means to obtain the position of mechanical advantage before leaning back? Well, you're not going to obtain the position of mechanical advantage. So, of course, Alexander renders assistance by the skillful use of his hands before the pupil goes into leaning backward. And uh, that is quite important and uh, he is very clear. Alexander has one hand holding books, uh, it, this, this procedure had different names at the time. It was called the cigar box procedure. It was called also the velvet brick 
procedure because Alexander was using that procedures all the time and uh, he was inclining the pupil and he was le leaving the pupil inclined for s some length of time with uh, a book in between the shoulder blades to make sure that the shoulder blades will stay apart and so um, while the pupil is uh, inclined backwards Alexander has only one hand upon the shoulder and he makes the pupil move back in space. Uh, you will see that this uh, asks questions. Okay, so I want to come back to the story. And the story is that, um, of course, uh, this is an old uh, tale. This is uh, 1910. This is the first book. Uh, Alexander lived until 1955. And uh, so he abandoned apparently he abandoned this uh, position of mechanical advantage completely we, you don't find any mention of mechanical a position of mechanical advantage in his books i can i can I've, I've searched i've tried to find it no it's gone it's absolutely gone so apparently uh, the somatic teacher i was mentioning uh, anthony kisley was right in saying that uh, uh, the technique has nothing to do with the position of mechanical advantage anymore. It's an old thing. So, uh, this taken into account, it's necessary to look at uh, uh, FM Alexander himself. Uh, and uh, this is um, a short video I've taken from the film of his uh, lessons. And this is not, uh, as you can see, the young Alexander. It's uh, an Alexander that is an, uh, 80 years of age. And when he mentions there is no mention of position of mechanical advantage in his books, uh, he still gives lessons, of course, and he gives lessons with his hands. And so it's interesting to watch uh, what the lessons are, are for. <laughs> and so this is uh, what's going on. You, you can see he's working with uh, Marjorie Barlow, I believe. And uh, oh, she's leaning back. OK, he's, uh, he's Oh yeah, he's making her lean back just before going to stand. And so he, he, she sits again and oh, she's leaning back again. Oh, she's leaning back further back. Alexander has just one hand, very, but I, I want you to notice, this is going to, to repeat. I want you to notice uh, how light Alexander's hands are when, oh, she's leaning back again. Uh, yes, because Alexander is uh, repeating this uh, position of mechanical advantage uh, series. Uh, well, a few times, oh, again. Oh, yes, the, but if you look at it, the lesson is made with it. Um, yes, I'm going to replay it because it's very interesting when she's leaning back. Uh, well, his hands are placed on the very top of uh, the structure, yes? And the person is looking very straight, very organized, yes? And uh, it's necessary to look at Alexander's right hand, how light it is on the shoulder. There is, this is not mechanical support he's offering. He's not uh, making the pupil maintain the shape. There is something that is maintaining the shape. So, uh, watching these two videos, oh, because yes, there are two, there is another part where he's working with a young Irish man. And it's interesting to contrast with this uh, image because the young Irish man has never had lesson with Alexander before, while uh, Marjorie Ball, Barlow at that time, um, sorry, Margaret Goldie is already a teacher. She's trained, she's, uh, she's worked with Alexander time and time again. So uh, it, it's, quite, uh, it's quite surprising that Alexander would, pre would present to the camera the same lesson to two different, completely um, different pupils in the sense that uh, one is, uh, well, a teacher of the Alexander Technique that has had numerous lessons with Alexander, while the other I never had lessons with Alexander at all. So uh, he's not mentioning the term position of mechanical advantage, uh, but um, well, it's obvious that uh, the lesson is about uh, using, obtaining, maintaining 
what we call, what he calls the position of mechanical advantage. So I was very interested in this. So there are details you will see that appears when, uh, so it, it's obviously uh, taking the pupil backwards. Yeah. Uh, I remember asking Walter Carrington if this was a uh, one on, uh, was it, uh, what was in the mind of Alexander when these films were taken? Did he want to, to explore something totally new and, uh, and oh, no, Walter Carrington told me that Alexander was doing this in, in with every one of his pupils. It, it was a, a basic move. So if it was such a basic move, why uh, was it not done with me? When I trained, I, I can tell you that this was not uh, a basic procedures of the modern Alexander technique at all. We, we were never uh, asked to incline the torso backward. We were never uh, considering uh, a very important uh, quote from uh, one other teacher, Irene Tasker, that uh, mentions uh, Alexander discussing with her brother that had lessened with Alexander when she was present. And uh, the discussion was about uh, leaning back. Because you lean back uh, when, of course, you work with Alexander and he's making you leaning back. But there is another case is that when you stand, if you realize when you stand, there is a moment when you incline the torso forward. But uh, as soon as you want to go up, the direction of the torso relatively to the legs is an extension. It's exactly the same direction of movement. So, uh, well, it's, for me, at first, I, I thought, well, it's, it's obvious that he's starting to prepare the pupil for the kind of activities that is necessary for going to rise from a chair, an extension of the torso. And when he talks, uh, according to Irene Tasker, during a lesson, he say, never let the head override the body in going backwards. So in this sentence, the body, <laughs> of course, is not the whole self because he's uh, making a difference between the head and the body. And the body is uh, seated on a chair, so uh, you cannot, uh, well, comprise the legs into the body. So Alexander used the term body as uh, well, I would use the, the term torso. Never let the head override uh, the body when going backwards. So suddenly, uh, you start to understand Alexander's right hand and left hand in this position. You start to see that, of course, a, uh, his right hand that is above the armpit level of the torso is maintaining a curve. So some teacher says, well, you can be uh, in a position of mechanical advantage in any uh, case or not, it does not matter. Uh, here it matters quite a lot. So there is a question of angles. There is a question of, uh, of geometry where we see that, uh, of course, the torso is not organized any which way. It's absolutely obvious that Alexander is maintaining a very aligned frontal part of the torso. There is no undue lifting of the front part of the torso. The front of the torso is exactly parallel to the portion of the torso beneath the armpit. And uh, there is the question of angle. It's absolutely obvious that Alexander is maintaining the upper thoracic spine, which is uh, right, going right up to, uh, well, thoracic one, very far forward of thoracic seven. It's, uh, it's, it's absolutely obvious that he maintains the head forward. He will not permit uh, for the head to movement to override the movement of the back. Suddenly, the whole concept of head leads and body follows is destroyed. Well, what is destroyed really is the principle, if, if you think it's a principle. A principle is a kind of rule that is applicable every time, everywhere, in every condition. Well, if every time you extend the torso away from the legs, so every time you stand, every time you, you finish your sitting motion, for example, you reach the chair and you extend, 
uh, then uh, the rule of the head leads and the body follows is smashed. It's, it's inappropriate, it's incorrect. So uh, it's very interesting to look at how you finish your standing or how you finish your sitting position, the uh, sitting uh, motion in order to obtain the position of sitting or the position of standing, because uh, it's the moment when most people, well, have no idea that the, the head movement should not override the movement of the torso. So. We, 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 we come to a point where there is a story that Alexander stopped talking about position of mechanical advantage. That story is correct. But there is another story with underlinings that says that uh, the position of mechanical advantage is, uh, does not apply to the Alexander technique. And so in 1950, five years before his death, or is that 51, five years before his death, uh, Alexander core of the, the work was uh, bringing the pupil into a position of mechanical advantage. So now, uh, what is interesting is um, how are we going to teach our pupil tomorrow? Of course, we need to explore this, uh, uh, this leaning back. We need to explore this geometry and uh, more importantly we need to understand what is behind it why is alexander doing this yes and so this is what i have uh, been doing so i have a, a bit of uh, an advance on you so i'm going to share my ideas the theories i have so that you can uh, contradict them if necessary or improve them if you can and so uh, it's obvious that we are dealing with poise I mean, uh, in French, poise is poids, which is weight, the, the sheer mass of things. Uh, it's obvious that the, the torso is, uh, well, like nine times heavier than the head. And so uh, how is the, this position possible? We, we, I'm show you, showing you a diagram where we see that a person is leaning against the chair uh, and um, we get into a situation where uh, the organism collapses at the front. Uh, it's something that um, when you look at uh, Alexander's lessons, Alexander has his hands at the very top. He's creating a great cantilever between the mass of the torso and the point of support that is very far forward of his hands. So uh, what is making the pupil stay upright? Why is the pupil not caving in in the center? It's, it's, like, uh, it's like gymnastic. He's asking the pupil to create a muscular effort to stay upright. It's, uh, well, yes, it's positioning. I understand it's positioning. Yes, it's, a, it's like a foul word in, in modern somatic um, uh, jargon. But uh, yes, yes, but how do we explain that the pupil is uh, staying upright? How do we explain that Alexander repeats this uh, obtaining position of mechanical advantage time and time again during the lesson? Yes, so uh, of course, uh, now there is physics, there is ugly physics. Yes, we, we, are, we are discussing again a pendulum mechanism. And uh, uh, the point with the pendulum mechanism, this is not for, for sitting, this is for standing, but it's the same problem, is that um, the bar that is maintaining the weight upright is uh, flexible, is uh, highly bendable. You can bend every which way with the torso. And so why is it that when Alexander is working with a pupil by holding the top of the structure in cantilever, there is no bending of the front of the torso. I started to think about this. This was, this was amazing. And uh, uh, when you look at uh, Alexander's explanation now, yes, uh, it's quite funny that um, uh, all he finds to say is that uh, he will then ask the pupil to rehearse the others orders mentally uh, yeah 
and he will rely upon the pupil mentally rehearsing the orders necessary to maintain and improve the conditions present to lean back without folding. Yes, of, of course, but he renders assistant by the skillful use of his hands before having the pupil lean back. So fine, he's established a position of mechanical in sitting before going into the position of mechanical advantage in leaning back. Why is the pupil not folding in the center? Yeah. Why is mentally rehearsing the others sufficient to maintain the conditions present? Well, the, the, I can't believe that uh, uh, words can uh, suddenly have a, a mechanical power. It's because you, you think some words, then uh, you think think up, for example. Let's say you have got the, the order think up, and you, you want to stay up. Well, you want to stay up, but what? Uh, the, the, the torso is made of different parts. Uh, the movement that you are submitted to requests that in order to maintain the shape, the speed of the different movements of the different parts of the torso have to be, well, regulated. Of course, it's the same uh, angular speed that you must have, which means in our term that the speed of the top has to be higher than the speed of the uh, medium part of the torso, which has to be faster than the speed of the lower part of the torso. This, this is absolutely necessary, otherwise you're going to, well, bend, fold the torso or you're going to try and maintain the torso by uh, will and muscles and if you do so if you contract any sort of muscles of the middle connection with the lower or with the uh, upper part you're going to to find that you are not leaning back in one piece this is uh, this is experimental i am absolutely certain of it so uh, how is it done <laughs> is the question so then uh, we come back to this and we find that of course there is a reaction the person has a reaction to falling and so uh, you start to think yes in fact uh, your equilibrium is in in, in jeopardy in some some ways when you go out of uh, uh, alignment yes and so i started to play with very simple mechanical ideas uh, we know that there is a point of rotation of the whole structure upon the chair well it's a sitting bone and uh, if the person knows how to maintain the conditions what are the conditions well the conditions are such that uh, uh, relative to the point of support the point of action of the weight is setting further and further back. Uh, we know this in mechanics, in ugly mechanics, as a torque. It's the, um, the tendency to create a movement. So what this is uh, showing is that there are what I call unseen movements that are created by the new disposition of the center of gravity relatively to the fulcrum. Uh, we call fulcrum a pivot um, that is um, working with a lever. So we have a lever and a lever is made on the principle that uh, uh, of course there is a moment arm between the point of action of the mass and the, the point of rotation of the structure. And so we see that there are unseen movement. Of course, there is one that is quite obvious, is that the structure will continue to fall. That's one obvious movement. There is one movement that is not that obvious, but is, uh, you, you can experience it. You will find it's absolutely impossible to have one movement without, in a moment of forces, there are at least two, two forces. There is one that is, in fact, making the whole structure slide forward. Uh, push forward on the chair. If there is nothing to prevent it, you will find, for example, uh, you can try this with uh, uh, rollers. Uh, rollers are shoes with, with wheels. <laughs> uh, for the old people like me, uh, it's, it's necessary to mention this. So if you, if you use, uh, for example, something that will prevent the friction of the feet on the floor, and so you use wheels, and you try to lean back, you will find that immediately you will tend to want to bring your feet backward 
because otherwise you're going to be pushed out of the chair. But there is a third unseen movement, and it is the most important. The third unseen movement is that, of course, if you were to attach a, a wire, a, a rope, to the front of the structure, you would find that the structure in falling is pulling. And it's pulling very strongly. I explained uh, in your last uh, video what I call load. This is a, an example of load, a very, very fine example. Yes, where uh, load is what we call carried weight. It's not only weight, it's carried weight. You have to uh, allow for a more uh, uh, complex concept where it's not only load, it's load relative to a fulcrum. When you have a load relative to a fulcrum and the further away it is from the fulcrum and the greater is the mass and the greater is the pool that you create. So you can use mass, yes, to generate enormous forces. It's not a force that is uh, uh, present in the structure. It's a force that depends on the geometry of the parts. If you can set this organization of the parts, then suddenly you have a, a lengthening force coming from above. Yes, you can use that, for example, if you wanted to lengthen the front of the torso. If you wanted to submit the torso to a lengthening pool, well, that's what we would do. Yes. And so we arrive at a situation where if you imagine that there are like guy ropes, like uh, um, uh, connections that have um, a resisting element in them. So you, we are going to talk about uh, fascia. We are going to talk about uh, tendons. There are tendons. These uh, structures are not muscle. They, they, they just resist stretch. Yes, of course, there are muscles too. We'll have to discuss our conception of muscles because for most people, uh, they have in mind uh, muscles as contracting uh, structures and shortening motors. They, if, you con if you overly contract a muscle, you're going to shorten. That's, that means that you understand shortening contractions. There are shortening contractions, but uh, scientists have another way to, in fact, look at muscles, it's when muscles are subjected to stretch, are subjected to lengthening. And uh, in certain cases, uh, you will find with the, for example, uh, the very deep fascia of the, of, that connects, in fact, the spine and the legs, which this is the psoas major, but most people ignore that around the psoas major, there is a very dense, yes, uh, connective tissue with reinforced fibers, and that cannot contract, that can only resist stretch. It's so strong that uh, movement is not being, going to be sufficient to stretch it. You need movement and, of course, a torque. Uh, uh, the, the action of uh, the weight at a distance from a fulcrum. Well, then you get enormous forces with very slow speed. So th th that is very important because um, lengthening contractions for muscles can be devastating when they are fast. Uh, at very slow speed something happens in muscle that is absolutely surprising. I've not prepared the quote here. I've been a bit taken by the time. Uh, but um, if you want, I can give you uh, everything that is necessary to understand that when you start uh, lengthening muscle with a lot of torque and uh, at very slow speed, suddenly it's uh, amazing. The response of the muscle is amazing. So suddenly uh, the muscle tendon unit or I would say the muscle tendon ligament fascia unit. Uh, I say unit because they are all subjected to the same pool. 
they start to act as one, as a unit, because they are subjected to pulls. Muscles, when they shorten, they tend to, well, slacken the fascia and the ligaments. Well, when suddenly a load is applied to all these connective tissues, they start to act as one. And, and, and the, the, the fascia is, um, in fact, uh, permeating the, the whole structure. So if you want a person to work as a unit, if you want the torso to work as a unit, it would be a good idea to start to learn about uh, what we call obtaining a position of mechanical advantage, because it's, it's what the, the, the idea I found. I have the impression that uh, it's quite obvious now that Alexander is trying to use load in order to really uh, create a unit out of the, the facial system, subjecting all the muscles and tendons and ligaments to the same antagonistic action the antagonistic action and so uh, for, for some people the term fascia is not clear so it's better to, to use a definition so I, I, I take an Adstrom definition because it's quite it's quite broad um, and so he says the terms fascia specifically specifically relate to a network of interacting interrelated interdependent tissues forming a complex whole, all collaborating to perform movement. Uh, in fact, that's from Teco, but it's uh, cited by Adstrom. And he says several fibrous structure, and he, there is a long list, aponeurosis, ligaments, tendons, reticul reticulina, joint capsule, and muscles have uh, traditionally been depicted as existing separately from fascia. They are now portrayed as different aspects of a unitary global fibrous tissue network called the fascial system. And uh, uh, I have shown, for example, uh, representations of the, the direction of the fibers. These are not muscles you see here. These are uh, the uh, elements, parts of the very complex thoracolumbar fascia that is uh, connecting the top of the structure with the pelvis and uh, further on from the pelvis right down to the legs. Well, uh, that's fine, okay? Uh, different aspect of a unitary global fibrous tissue network. Yes, but there is, a, there is a caveat, there is a problem, is that this is only active when the person is lengthening, stretching and uh, using load. Uh, what else is uh, taking a person out of equilibrium in sitting, if not requesting the person to use load? Mechanical advantage, yes? Is, uh, there is no effort necessary. Y you are sitting, you just need to allow yourself to uh, lean backward, yes? and. Um, the skillful assistant of the hands. You must understand that there are different ways to look at images. Many people think that uh, the, the skillful use uh, of the hand that Alexander is providing is support. Of course, if you provide support and if the pupil uses support, well, the loads disappears. And uh, the effect of loads on uh, uniting all these uh, tissue network comprising muscle is going to disappear so the skillful use of the hands is not to support the torso i maintain that alexander's hand first of all is too high why is well uh, the first image you need to see is this one if you get a person sitting to lean back with all the weight of the torso rotating around the sitting bone, well, you're most likely to find that the person is going to collapse. I've seen so, so many people sitting on chairs with exactly this organization of the movements of the parts. The parts of the middle torso is sagging backward. And uh, of course, there is a question of angles. Yes, 
and uh, the further back you lean, well, the further uh, the load is going to act on the fascia. And so, uh, why is it that uh, the beginner that is working with Alexander is not collapsing in the center? Yeah? Well, it's because it's inappropriate. Why is it that we, we, we do not uh, sit with the shoulders higher and the torso lower? Why? Well, there is a reason for that. Yes, the geometry of the fall of the shoulder also is part of it. If you raise your shoulders and lean back, you will find that there is a lack of antagonistic action. You are going to shorten the muscles of the neck and is that a good use of the parts? Not if you want to obtain a position of mechanical advantage. Simple. Yeah. So uh, from that, you start to reason out and you think, well, what is happening when a muscle is lengthened by load? What is happening when a fascia or when a ligament, when... Uh, even the, the muscles, muscles uh, concept are very crude. Most people uh, use the, the word muscle without understanding that a muscle is part of a chain. There, there is, of course, uh, a tendon at each uh, extremities. And the tendon is not contractile. The, the tendon is exactly the same material as fascia. And so it's much better to talk about a, a muscle tendon unit or and, and if everything is pulled, is stretched, then you get, of course, a unitary system. And so you can start to discover that when Alexander is making the pupil lean back, well, first of all, he's stretching the uh, abdomen, abdominal fascia. Well, it's an uh, abdominal uh, muscle fascia unit. You know, the, we call it in English, they call it the six pack because uh, there, are, uh, there is a long fascia and that long fascia has little bands of muscles. So it's obvious that uh, the, the procedure of obtaining the position of mechanical advantage is to transform this into a unit with resistive power. Yes, so that there is no acceleration of the upper torso faster than the middle torso where the head would lead and the body would arch backward yes to prevent uh, the head to override the torso you have to prevent the spine yes to bend you have to prevent uh, the upper spine to come back in space at the same speed as the middle spine yeah it's necessary for the head to be forward and up that uh, this well cervical spine should be forward and up and for the cervical spine to be forward and up the upper thoracic spine has to be forward and up relatively to the middle spine so suddenly alexander's actions become well like understandable is preparing going to stand and why, why leaning back? Well, stretching uh, springs as uh, a function, well, more than one function, if you want. It's, uh, of course, there is the resisting function. It's obvious that when you, you, you can lean back very far without any sort of effort for any length of time, if you understand the position of mechanical advantage. But it's not only that, it's that springs mechanism store elastic energy when you stretch a spring under load with with a, so under load means you stretch with a strong force it's a very slow but very strong force because the torque involves of course the whole weight of the upper body the whole weight of the torso shoulders arms head everything is going back and at very slow speed is stretching the spring and so the spring as long as it is stretched you know it's like a, you understand a catapult so you are making a movement let's say you take two seconds to arm the catapult and then the catapult can stay in this position like forever 
until you release the catch. When you release the catch, what happens? Well, the stored mechanical energy in the spring is going to power the movement of standing. Alexander is asking the person to lean back because he's preparing for having to stand. And he wants the person to stand not with her usual habits of using the muscles of the legs separately from the muscle of the torso, shoulders and, head and neck. No, he wants a unitary action. He wants all the springs to function at the same time and power. The movement upright this is why when you hear uh, you know reports of alexander's lessons with his pupil and he's asking the pupil to stand and uh, after a while the pupils say i would never never have thought that possible to stand without well the habitual muscular effort that is necessary and uh, this solution, this working as a whole solution, is impossible to imagine without the position of mechanical advantage. Otherwise, yes, there is one solution. If you believe in somatic magic, if you believe that uh, there are people with, uh, with such nice personality, such nice understanding of somatics and how to, in fact, um, make sure that the pupil is never uh, endangered, never uh, in a position where his uh, fear reflexes could be started. You imagine fear reflexes when you're asking a person to lean back with so little support? <laughs> well, um, no, you don't because you, you haven't experienced it. But uh, have a lesson with me and you will find that, uh, well, at first it's, it, it's quite strange. First of all, most people imagine an effort, m imagine that, well, how do, you, uh, how do you, in fact, maintain the structure from collapsing and from falling without uh, straining the neck, without uh, making a, a, a strenuous effort? Most people want to make an effort to maintain the structure. If they do, it fails. <laughs> uh, the position ad advantage is not obtained. And uh, we know that because um, the angles, the geometry, the, uh, the lines are not there anymore. So there are stories, yes. And uh, these stories are all different. Uh, there are people that say that uh, it doesn't matter the angle, it doesn't matter uh, what sort of movement you're making. It's in, in, the use of the self is something that is uh, a, a kind of uh, attitude or attitude and, and a, a kind of a prepared reaction. I do not believe in this discourse at all. I do really believe that uh, angles matters. I do really believe that uh, load uh, will be obtained only if you consider uh, distances, if you consider ugly mechanics. Yes, the kinematics is absolutely important. Otherwise, you have to resort to and imagine, theorize. You have to have stories that say that uh, there is a system in the in the brain that is going to in fact activate the muscle with the proper tone proper activation you're going to believe that uh, all the different parts are suddenly made uh, to work coordinately because there are programs that uh, are geared to a certain position of the head and neck this is the, the scientific, uh, well, the modern scientific explanation of the Alexander Technique. I don't buy it at all. I don't. It's impossible. For me, it, it, it's absolutely impossible that in one lesson, Alexander could suddenly orientate uh, the neck and head in such a way as to trigger that response that is uh, coming from where? Uh, the person has never had this experience before. And so... I do really believe that Alexander is using geometry. If you, if you look at his hands, that, for example, it's the same lesson and uh, he's preparing the skillful use of the hands. Look at what he's doing. He's making sure that uh, the upper thoracic spine is very, very that, that's where his thumb 
is pointing. And if you look at the geometry of his hand, the conformation of his hands, it's absolutely obvious that his, in, uh, his index finger and thumbs are at a certain angle, is maintaining the upper thoracic spine very, very far forward of his little finger. He's creating a curve. It must be important because he's not doing it once. He's repeating the action during the whole lesson. He's doing it not only with that pupil, with another one. We are discussing this curve. That's what Alexander is, uh, is working with here. He's making sure that the person can orientate the upper thoracic spine without collapsing the head forward, which is happening here. And he will correctly, he will very swiftly correct after that. So we are uh, now uh, discussing two different stories that have nothing in common. Uh, there is one story that states that at the end of his life, Alexander was all about uh, instantaneous change, like where the, it will happen to the pupil. It's the teacher that matters. There is one story that says uh, it's the teacher attitude. It's the teacher reaction that is going to be communicated with his hands. Alexander is not communicating in attitude. He has, a, he has a clear plan of what uh, geometrical conformation he wants. He, th th there are ways that you will not be capable of leaning back. Where, where you, if you do lean back, you're going to lose your, your uh, freedom. You're going to, in fact, lack freedom of movement. There is a way to lean back that will enhance your way of movement. So uh, this is absolutely not a transmission of an attitude. It's clearly a transmission of principles. It's, it's something the pupil cannot feel. I doubt that Alexander can feel anything or wants to feel anything. He wants to make certain that the person is lengthening. Is lengthening as a unit is lengthening as a whole. And uh, that's his way. So we, in fact, there are many muscles, many parts that are involved. I, I've just described a few. And uh, by having the pupil go, uh, well, obtain the position of mechanical advantage, the position of mechanical advantage is as much when you're sitting as when you're leaning back. It's exactly the same one. And so you've got, I already mentioned the abdominal fascia. There is the psoas major group. Uh, I should uh, include the psoas, um, uh, the iliopsoas, sorry. Uh, the iliopsoas is uh, that muscle that is connecting uh, in the inside of the femur, passing over the front of the, of the pelvis where uh, the rotator cuff is, above the rotator cuff, and uh, applied to the sides of the ilium bone. And so, most people uh, are having the iliac very far forward, which means that uh, the lower sacrum is lifted. Yeah. And this uh, brings the weight of the torso that is communicated through the lever of the pelvis to very near the point of action, which means that there is no load. People are, are afraid of load. I think the back go back will in fact, uh, completely change the conditions where when the back is going back, what's going to happen is that instead of having a muscle that is activated to pull and to shorten, well, then suddenly the weight of the back is, is, is going to stretch that muscle. So there is a difficulty because a muscle can be stretched and released which means that uh, if you release the muscle, the muscle part of the unit of the tendon of the muscle tendon unit, the muscle part will become slack. It will not resist and the person will completely collapse backward. While if the person maintains a very slow activation, uh, uh, for, for most people that doesn't mean much, but it means uh, very little, no idea of effort, but uh, an idea of refusing to release. 
it's like neck, let the neck be free. Uh, we are not asking the person to make an effort, but we are not asking the person to release and collapse. We are asking the person to maintain, for exa example, an idea of stretch, an idea of lengthening. Lengthening as an action. So you think, okay, I'm going to lengthen the iliac away from the knee. You, we, you, everybody knows knees forward and away. They don't know knees forward and away from what? Uh, the knees are attached to the front of the pelvis through uh, the, quad, the quadriceps muscle, especially the rectus femoris, which is attached here. And so this is the perfect position because in leaning back, the whole group of muscle of the front of the thigh is going to be submitted to the very strong movement. By strong movement, I don't mean fast, I mean very slow movement, but with the whole weight of the torso acting on it, then not only, of course, the iliopsoas that we see depicted here, but the whole quadriceps muscle is going to be stretched and start to gather elastic energy that can be readily used next time you want the person to stand. This is um, a very simple way to understand what is obtaining the position of mechanical advantage. Having the person use the load of the torso. For the moment, you're, you're looking at an image where there is a teacher. What is most funny? is that the teacher doesn't need to put his hands on the person to obtain the same op the same effect. Yes, in conscious guidance uh, lessons, I do not, I'm so far away, it's a long distance lesson, I don't touch people. But this is absolutely possible for any, any individual that understands geometry. Uh, that understand language, if you want, uh, because uh, some people have a, a strange idea that uh, geometry is something odd and difficult and something they would never understand. In fact, uh, uh, it's better to discuss l a language. If you understand English or Spanish or French, I can, I can give you a lesson and you will experiment what it means to, in fact, obtain, obtain a position of mechanical advantage. So we, we have a representation, well, in fact, it's three different representations of uh, uh, a certain procedure. So we see that, uh, uh, of course, on the left, it's uh, taken from the film. We see that uh, above the armpit line that is shown by the yellow arrow, uh, something very strange is governed by Alexander with very, very definite ideas, uh, definite uh, angles and uh, uh, relationship of movements because remember the person is moving in space so we want that the upper torso move at a certain speed and so uh, the representation on the center is a representation of the idea of antagonistic action there is an antagonistic action between the load that is created by the weight of the torso relatively to the point of support so the fulcrum here is the sitting bones and we know that this is engendering a very strong of course moment of forces a very strong torque that torque that propension of movement doesn't have to be fast it can be very slow but as there is the whole weight of uh, the structure above the chair that is pulling on it we know that uh, if there are springs if there are connective tissues that have the tendency to resist stretch, they are go all going to, use, to, to be used as a unit. It's very important, the use of the parts. How do you use parts to create a unit? Yes. So this uh, general action of the system is not something that the person needs to organize. It's not something that uh, uh, the person must uh, activate some muscle and stop activating other muscles. No, it's, this would be so complex. It's impossible to imagine that the person would be capable with the conscious mind to start releasing muscles that are too activated, activate the muscles that are out of action. Impossible. Yet, if you understand that there is already a connective system that is in fact uh, linking all the parts together 
then it's possible to imagine that you could, in fact, lengthen the, the general mechanism, create the kinematics, create movements that uh, uh, enhance this possibility that is very simple. We want the tendons, the ligaments and the muscle to work as a unit. Functionally, this is simple. It just needs for them all to be stretched, to be lengthened and widened. So this harmonious expansion of the torso of the Delsartian is exactly the same idea. If you can find the movement that will stretch the back and the front at the same time, then suddenly you should discover that there are uh, new movements that will appear that are generally organized. And so on the right, you see a very simple idea where there is a, a strange pendulum. Uh, it's an inverted pendulum. There is a, a, a lever at the bottom that is connected with the, the chair. It's, it's like it's, it's got a form of a, a pelvis, more or less. And on top of it, we have, uh, of course, the mass of the torso and the mass of the head. And so the idea is to uh, set that mass into action by simply uh, thinking of lengthening. You're going to lengthen. So this has to be organized because uh, lengthening is a simple word, but uh, as there are different parts that are articulated to uh, jointed together, well, it's necessary to organize the movement of the middle and lower torso and the movement of the upper torso relatively to the two. So the organization of the lower and middle torso apparently are to create a very straight back. The back is going back and the upper torso is sent forward, forward and upward. And so then you understand the unseen forces. There is this idea that the weight is going to pull. Of course, the sitting bones are going to be projected forward. But the most important uh, force is that you see the yellow one. What is happening is that suddenly, if there are muscles and fascia that are attached to the pelvis, then uh, these will, in fact, be stretched. So we get suddenly a unitary form of action between the front of the torso, all the, the muscles that are resisting the stretch, which is uh, the one I've mentioned earlier, the abdominal, the psoas group, of course, the quadriceps and the iliotibial tract, all these are going to be subjected to the same stretch. Not because the person is contracting, it's just the person is, uh, refuse, refuses to release, refuses to have the muscle act and become slack. No, everything is stretched at the same time. So this uh, represents a theory and uh, the lessons of Conscious Guidance Center on Coral that I give are just uh, providing an, um, well, objective demonstration, ocular demonstration to the pupil using only the pupil's organisms and mind. The reasoning of the person, I'm going to, I've discovered that um, Alexander Splain has been to touch people and make them experience. Uh, he hoped that they would uh, study uh, the principles. Uh, it has not been the case. Today, the, the Alexander technique is a somatic technique where people uh, don't care for movements, they don't care for unitary reaction of a system. They, they just think that uh, if you are kind, if you're nice, if you are uh, acceptance, if you have acceptance, uh, everything is going to go well. Um, and that you should never say to a pupil that the pupil is uh, overriding the movement of the middle torso with the movement of the upper torso. It's quite different from the uh, initial Alexander technique, I can tell you. It's the opposite. Well, not the opposite because we have nothing in common, really. It's like there is no common ground. We. I have very much difficulty uh, discussing with uh, somatic teachers because uh, I can't find any, any common ground. The position of mechanical advantage still exists.
Brilliant. Thank you, John Doe. Um, you mentioned kinematics earlier. Can you give people a very quick definition of what the, um, the discipline of kinematics so they know yes. what you're talking about uh, and how you use it in a lesson? Yes. In fact, um, it's, it's just uh, a way at representing uh, what we see, representing movements. Uh, when, when you, well, of course, it's part of, the, of physics. There is uh, kinematics and there is kinetics. When you, you, when you use kinetics, you observe forces. You, you observe the behavior of forces. When we discuss kinematics, we observe with the language of geometry, uh, the dynamics of movements. We, sorry, for example, when you see somebody leaning, you want to understand, uh, for example, in geometry, we can analyze speed. We can, uh, and, uh, you, you, the rate of space that is covered in the same amount of time by the lower torso, by the middle torso and by the upper torso. It's obvious that the upper torso is making uh, in the same amount of time is describing a longer arc than the middle torso and the lower torso. This is the this is what we call kinematics. Kinematics is observing movements with uh, tools that uh, uh, enable you to, uh, f first of all, t theorize, but also control. We, we, we want to measure. We want, for example, when you look at a video and you look at a person leaning backward or leaning forward, uh, with a video, it's very simple to observe uh, the amount of movement that is made by different parts uh, during the same amount of time. This is kinematics. So Thanks. for us, we call it conscious control, but um, okay. it's the same thing, really. Per perfect. Thank you. Uh, for people watching the video, you'll find a link to John Doe's website underneath if you want to book a lesson with him. And we will see you in the next video. Thank you, John Doe. You're welcome.